morning, everybody. My name is Terry. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you are brand new sitting on the floor up in the balcony or if you're watching at home online, welcome. We're really excited that you've decided to be a part of our church today um, as we have been walking through this series called Gear up and uh, and what we've been talking about. If you're a follower of Jesus in this room, you've heard this term before, um, or maybe you haven't. Or if you're not a Christian and you're here today, welcome. We're really excited that you're here today. Um, as we talk about what it means to put on the full armor of God. There's a guy by the name of Paul, and Paul writes this to a church um, in Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey, and he is writing to them and and really kind of teaching and pouring into them about what it means to be followers of Jesus, both Jew, Gentile, all in itself, and he's kind of teaching all of this. And so recapping a little bit, um, if you were here in the first week, we talked about putting on the full armor doesn't mean get ready because you're going to go fight. That's not what this means, and and it's not medieval knight armor either. Um, What it was is, is putting on an armor that was flexible, putting on an armor that you would be comfortable wearing every single day because every single day as a follower of Jesus, we are called to be able to be ready for whatever God gives us. In other words, we put on the armor not to defend against our lives. We put on the armor so we can live the best life possible that God wants to live through us. And so that's why we put on this armor is, oh, we have such an amazing life that God wants us to live. And then when we went to the next week, Pastor David, he unpacked what it meant. The first piece of armor were to take on and put on the belt of truth. And the reason why the the writer Paul says that the belt is the first to put on, it's almost a soldier putting on his belt of weapons to be able to be prepared. And so it's that idea that the truth is where our focus needs to be, is to always be mindful what God's truth is. Last week, we talked about what it means to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And what we said is, is that the most vital organ of a follower of Jesus is the heart. And we said we need to make sure that we're careful to protect the heart. And we learned last week that our heart is not ours. It's God's. And so when we talk about the breastplate of righteousness, what we said is, is righteousness is a right heart with God, but what it means is, is to make sure that our hearts are his, that he wants to live his life in and through us. And today, we're going to focus on a different part of the body, and we're going to focus on the feet. And so kind of getting into ready to be able to talk about it, um, in our culture today, if you haven't noticed it, there is this phenomenon going around, and it's, it's a marketing term, um, whether it be by app, whether it be by online, whether it be in brick and mortar, but there's this whole idea of a drop system. Have you ever heard of this before? Where maybe you've got, like, for instance, Best Buy is, is one of my stores that I love to go to. I love to just kind of peruse in the electronics, so to speak. And so at Best Buy, what they've come up with now is since they're a brick-and-mortar sh- shop as well, they have brick-and-mortar drops. And what that means is, is that if you are online and you're looking and all of a sudden they have something that's going to drop in a few hours, that when it drops, it's going to be a specific price. And if you go in, in the store, you can even get it for a cheaper price. But it's this idea that hey, it's short term. You need to hurry up. You need to make a quick decision. Um, How many marketers, their their jobs are dependent upon people making impulsive decisions. And so they create this drop system. And so at Best Buy, you can do that now. Do you know also that they have a drop system um, with regards to sneakers? And there is this whole phenomenon that has been going on for the last few years. And in fact, there is a, a an individual, um, a group of individuals known as sneakerheads. How many of you are sneakerheads in the room? Would you dare to admit it? But we do have some sneakerheads in the church. I won't call them out, but we do have some sneakerheads. And what, what does that mean? Like, well, Pastor Terry is being rude. No, no, no. What a sneakerhead is is someone who collects and like, like really loves this idea of these amazing sneakers. And they collect them, and they sell them, and they wear them, or they show them off. Like, it's a collective piece, and they drop every once in a while, and you pay for them. If you're not aware of this, like if you went online right now, I just, I just kind of Googled it and went online. Um, so a, a few days ago, they had the Adidas, by the way, it's not Adidas, it's Adidas for all of you individuals who want to know the right way to say it, Adidas, they have uh, the Lionel Messi Gazelle 
Trunfo and it Dorado, and it is priced at $109. And so you could have gone the other day, and you could have gotten this sneaker for $109. For those of you who are basketball fans, the Nike LeBron 21 World Is Your Oyster shoe is $199. Now, some of you in the room where if you maybe grew up in a generation where I did, you're like, I am never spending $200 on a pair of shoes. That's crazy. Some of you are like, have you looked at the prices lately? It's $100 for just your regular pair of shoes. So Michael Jordan, for those of you who don't know, he was the greatest basketball player who ever played. Sorry, I'm from Chicago. I have to say that. But Michael Jordan, he, wants, he, he went into retirement. There are conspiracy theories and everything else is why. But he went into retirement for two years, and he went into minor league baseball. Do you remember this time, some of you? And, uh, and so when he did, he was a, a subpar average minor league baseball player. I give him credit because none of us probably could have just gone from basketball to play baseball and, and really even competed. So props to him. But do you know that he sells a baseball cleat as a subpar minor league baseball player? player, and it goes for $189. It's the Air Jordan 3 Retro Black Cement Baseball Clay, even to this day. It's amazing. And then if you want to get into some basketball shoes, you have the Air Jordan 4 Paris Olympic shoes. Those are $225. Now, some of you are gawking at this price going, this is crazy. Oh, no, 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 no. And if you're a sneakerhead, you know where I'm going. Because you know what the most expensive shoe that sold just recently was? It was the Air Jordan 13 Last Dance priced at $2.2 million. Yes, I, that got a reaction. So, Terry, great. Thank you for sharing all that. Why is this important? Well, did you know that actually in biblical times, shoes were referenced also? That we had, that it's almost as God wanted us to be sneakerheads. Because in the Bible, there, there were kind of reminders made with shoes. So, case in point, when Moses met God, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, I wanted to show it to you. It says this, God said, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, your shoes, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Shoes were really important that day because they were reminders of stances in our lives. So when we approach God, where are we standing? How are we standing? What are we wearing? Where are we at in our lives? And Moses walked up to approach God, and he was wearing sandals, and it was like, hey, you're approaching God. You're going to see him face to face. Take your shoes off. It it was a reminder of who God is in Moses' life. Just this week, I had two individuals. It was random, but I had two individuals from our church email me separately the same question. Terry, what does it mean to have a healthy fear of God? Does that mean to be afraid of God? And you see in this right here, it's like, no, it's not to be afraid, but it's to know who you're talking to. If you're a follower of Jesus, he's God. He's the creator of the universe. He's the one who gave you breath. He's the one who knows when you're going to die. So when we approach him, we, whoa, I'm about to talk to the king. Let me, let me, let me back up a little bit. And so we have to know and take our sandals off because we are standing on holy ground. It happened again with all of the Israelites. The Israelites had a moment where they had to know where they stood. Take a look at this. This is Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 2. Moses summoned all the Israelites and said to them, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh, to all of his officials, and to all his land. With your own eyes you saw those great trials, those signs and great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. Yet, the Lord says, during the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. So God uses shoes once again to say, hey, check your shoes right now. You spent 40 years walking through some of the worst desert. You had food to eat. You were protected. And your sandals are still intact. Some of us, we can't get through three months. How many of you have a middle schooler? Try getting through three months with a middle schooler shoes, okay? That's a miracle. Some of you middle school parents, you, right now, if you don't know Jesus, you should come to know Jesus right now. Like, oh, he's God. For 40 years, sandals made it? Oh, my gosh. And again, it's a reminder that God will be with us, that God will sustain us. And so sometimes we have to be mindful when we put our shoes on, whoa, God provides. We see another uh, sneaker head in the Bible. His name was Boaz. And we see a symbol through his action. Take a look at this in Ruth chapter 4, verse 7. It says, now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. 
This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. This was a great picture and a great symbol that when you wanted to transfer ownership of a piece of property, taking off the sandal meant this. I walked in this property. I know this property. My feet have touched this property, and I've lived in this property. And now I take this property. And then I hand it off to you for you to own, for you to live, for you to sustain, for you to walk. I want you to invest in this property. And it was a very symbolic act. Did you know this? You notice the the redeemer part in this. That Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. And today when we put on shoes, we're to mind this. Aren't you thankful that when life gets tough and you look up at God and go, God, do you even understand what's going on in my life? What I love is, and whenever I've said that, I know this. God looks at me and said, oh, Terry. I've walked in your shoes, bud. My son lived and emoted everything that you're facing and worse. And so when you look up at me, number one, take your shoes off because you're talking to God. Number two, remind yourself that everything that you have comes from me. Number three, I want you to remind something is is that when you talk to me, I know exactly what you're going through because I've been there. And you know what my son did when he died on the cross? He went ahead and said, hey, give me your shoe, Terry. Your shoe is dirty, filthy, sinful, and I'm going to exchange it for my shoes, which are heavenly. And so, oh, powerful, isn't it, that we were redeemed. And so when we put on those shoes, oh, incredible. Now, it's not all roses and butterflies either. Poor, everyone on the count of three say, poor Amos. Ready? One, two, three. Poor Amos. Amos lived during a time in which God wasn't very happy with his people. I want to show you this. This is Amos chapter 2, verse 6. It says, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. This is when God's people were not doing the right thing and God was not happy with them. And he uses the idea of a sandal to say, I have blessed you, I have protected you, I have given you, I have a plan for your life, and what are you doing with your life? You're just throwing your sandals around as if they mean nothing. How many of us are living life and we're living way carefree and we're not really even focusing on our actions or what we do or what we say? And so when we put sandals on, it's a great reminder. Oh, God. I have great responsibility as a follower of Jesus and great influence in my kids, my grandkids, my spouse, my friends. My life is beyond me. Oh, let me remember that when I put shoes on. Last but not least, I'm a historian and I had to put this in there. How many of you ever heard of the guy by the name of Alexander the Great? Ever heard of him? Okay, three people. Wow. (laughs) Man, let me write to the scholastic, you know, news. You need to start teaching history once again. There was a guy by the name of Alexander the Great, and he was known as an amazing general, and he did. He won so many battles that many people thought he was going to lose. And some people, they thought he was a great, you know, great strategic thinker. He was. He made great decisions. He did. But do you know one of the things that he did, though, is he made sure that his army was outfitted with proper shoes. And the shoes that his army would wear from time to time, they had little spikes at the bottom of them. So that when they would hit terrain that was either muddy or, you know, be in a terrain that there wasn't much traction, he knew this, that if we had the proper footwear, even when we faced giants, that we could hold our ground. And when they slipped and when they fell, um, parents or children turn aside for a second, then we can take our feet and we can stamp on the enemy. And that's what his army used to do. The Romans used to do that as well. So, Terry, great. Why are you sharing all this? Because it leads us up to the piece of armor we're going to talk about today, and Paul is going to tell us. So we've been already gotten so much today, a great reminder when we have our shoes, what we need to be thankful for. But Paul is going to take it one step further, and it's great because we have to learn what it is together. So Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to recap chapter 10, or verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand then firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and here's our next one, 
with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. I'm going to say that again. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. Of peace. Terry, what in the world does that mean? Okay, yesterday I was traveling through the Atlanta airport. I went to visit our, our students. I was speaking at a camp in Indiana. I traveled all the way to Asheville, North Carolina to see our students at camp, and then I traveled on Saturday back home early in the morning. I've been through the Atlanta airport. I know it like the back of my hands. I, I can... I can Traverse it any which way. So it was early in the morning. I'm coming up the escalator. For those of you who've been through the Atlanta airport, you know you get up to one of the terminals. And when you go, um, sometimes it dumps you off into a food court. Um, that is strategic, by the way. And so when you're dumped into the food court, you have to walk into a big open center section that is covered in white tile. They just renovated the last five years. It looks beautiful, but it's covered in white tile. I've been there so many times. But when I get up on the escalator, one of the things I always do is I check my phone for where my gate is for my next plane. And then when you get off the escalator, what you do is, is your head looks up to the signs that point to the, the way in which you're supposed to turn, either right or left, depending on what gate you're in. So I get up, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, how many of you gotten up in the morning, you drive to work, and you don't even remember how you got there? That's like the Atlanta airport for me. I, I get on the train, I get off, I get on the escalator, I go up, so I'm not even paying attention, and I look up, and I'm walking forward, there's nobody in front of me, and I'm walking forward with my luggage, and I look up, and I see the gates, and I see that, I'm kind of looking, okay, this gate says this way, is my, no, that's not my gate, and so I'm continuing to walk, and as I'm walking, then all of a sudden, I, I turn over here, and I look over here, and I see my gate, and I'm like, oh, that's my gate, I've got to go to the right, so I take one step to the right, and then all of a sudden, I know I've got a problem. I've got my backpack on, I've got my suitcase here, and all of a sudden, I step on something. And you ever have that moment where you know that all of a sudden, the traction of your shoe is no longer there? Like your shoe has lost connection with white tile. And so then all of a sudden, one foot goes, and so I go, uh-oh, my other foot is already in the air, and I, I quickly step down, and all of a sudden, I notice that my left foot no longer has traction either. So what I had not seen is uh, literally about three minutes before I got up on that escalator, somebody was coming to fill the big ice machine in the food court. They actually dropped the big bucket of ice, the ice strewn across the floor in the white tile. So as I'm walking with my head looking up to see where I'm going, I'm not paying attention to where I'm walking, and all of a sudden I step on ground that I am no longer ready for. And how many of you have ever seen the movie Home Alone? Do you remember the scene where the two bad guys, all of a sudden, they're doing this on marbles or whatever it is, and then they go, what? What happens to their legs? The next thing I saw was not the sign. I saw my two feet because I flipped up backwards, and I landed right in on the tile, on the mess, everything. I was wet. I was bruised. I was battered. I heard people scream, and I got up, and I remember walking and calling my wife and saying, hey, pray for me. I just fell, and she's like, are you okay? And I said, I think I'm okay. I said, the worst thing that happens is my pride was hurt. That's it. True story. This is not in the notes, but there was a guy next to me, and he was off to the right, and so as I'm walking, I, you know, he stopped when I fell, and then I got up, and then he, he's walking with me, and he goes, he goes, yeah, he goes, you know, he said, honestly, he said, I was there, and he said, I, I, I took one step, and I looked down, and I saw it, and he says, and I, I'm, I'm so glad, because the, the attention and the, the yelling caused me to look down even closer, and I was able to catch myself. So I said, in other words, you're happy that I fell? So then I told him to go to, no, I didn't do that. I didn't do, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. No, I didn't do that. But why am I sharing this? Paul says that we, our feet are to be fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. It means that when we walk in life as a follower of Jesus, that we are to walk with readiness. Well, Terry, readiness. What readiness is Paul talking about? What is he referring to? Well, let's take a look. In Isaiah, there was a prophet. His name was Isaiah. And he once spoke because it says the gospel of peace. So what does that mean? Let's put it together. Isaiah 52, 7 says this. Isaiah said, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So we see Isaiah talk about what it means to be the gospel of peace. However, 
Don't go to sleep yet because you're going to walk out of here with the wrong context. Isaiah says, how happy are the feet of those who proclaim good news. And, and good news comes from the Greek word, and guys, follow me, euangelion. Euangelion is, is a Greek word that, that means good news. Now, let's pause here for a second. What is the good news that Isaiah is referring to? He is talking specifically about what God is doing, what God planned to do. And what God planned to do was to send his son to die on a cross. Now, pause, because this is, the, this is where you can wake up, and if you can get this, you can go to sleep for the next 10 minutes, okay? This is the main point here, because if you can understand this, then you've got it. When Jesus Christ died, so many symbolic things happened and were fulfilled. So many things for us as followers of Jesus were happening at that moment. But theologians love to simplify, and I do too. And, and there's a few theologians that have said this. Look, if you understand that really what Jesus did was two things, if you get this, then you understand the good news. What he did was this. When he died on a cross and beat death and he rose and rose from the dead, he, number one, fulfilled God's plan in restoring God's people with him. You see, we have sin. Sin separated us from God. And when Jesus died on the cross, we his creation was restored. There was a pathway restored so that we could have fellowship with God once again. That's, that's good news, right? That's good news. The second thing, though, that happened also, and this is where it's interesting for you Bible study students, is not only were we restored with God, but then God has an expectation that not only are Jews restored to God, but Gentiles, Gentiles anything other than Jewish, all other peoples, Gentiles were not only restored to God, but there is an expectation then when Jesus rose from the dead that we are to be restored together. That brothers and sisters, that there is no animosity between us because of the gospel of peace, the good news. Well, Terry, what do you mean by that? Isn't it very simple? Like some of you, you know, like we all, we all have friends and different things like that. How many of you have someone in the church right now, and you're not going to admit it, but how many of you have someone in the church that you just can't stand? Don't look at them. Don't do it. Don't look at them. You'll give it away. You'll give it away. Don't look at your spouse. That would be bad. <laughs> but isn't it true? Let's just get real. Like there are some people that we get along with, and there are some people that let's just talk within the church realm. We're walking down the hallways, and we see that person that we can't stand, and we just walk the other way because we don't want to be near them. And when Jesus Christ died and when he rose from the dead, here's what happened. He said, you no longer have to have animosity toward that person. Because you can agree to disagree with that person. When that person comes up to you and you can't stand them and they say, good morning, you can say, good morning. Why? Because you remember what shoes you're wearing. Because you remember, you know what, when I woke up this morning, aren't I really thankful that everything is a gift from God? Aren't I really thankful that I have his shoes on? Aren't I really thankful that he died on a cross for me? And so you know what? At the end of the day, if I were to die today, you know what? I'm good. And so even though I'm talking to a person that I can't stand, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm good. So I can look at that person and I can truly with a heart of honor go, good morning. And then when I walk past them, I could talk about them to others. No, I won't do that. I won't do that. But do you get the point? Is that you understand where you stand. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he said, look, the gospel, don't miss this, the gospel of peace is there. You see, because sin is chaos. When the enemy entered the world, he introduced sin, and sin created chaos. And when Jesus Christ beat death, guess what he did? He simplified everything. When all of a sudden we go and we're like, God will never talk to me. God doesn't like me because I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. I broke this principle. I broke this, I did this, I did this, I did that. I cheated on that test in eighth grade. I did this, I did this, I did this. Do you know what happens in that moment? Jesus. 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 Simple. Covered. Peace. You don't have to explain. You don't have to make excuses. Well, I was really young and stupid. You don't have to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't need it. Jesus, the gospel of peace. Euangelion actually comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, if you're a Robin Hood fan. Um, and if you're a theater fan, you're going to like this. Do you know what that means? The Anglo-Saxon word is the, the story means the story concerning God. The other term for that is Godspell. So if you ever wonder in the theater world why the theater production of the gospel is Godspell, it's because God's message, God's spell, good news. So Paul says, have your feet fitted with the readiness for the gospel of peace.
peace. Now, I'm going to land the plane, so I want you to lean in here a little bit, but I want to show you something. Because Jesus Christ, when he was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he looked at two individuals, and we've read this story many times, but now with understanding that what Paul is saying is, is that we have feet fitted with the readiness of understanding the gospel of peace. That we know where we stand, we know what has happened in our life, and I'm good. And so no matter who comes at me, no matter who throws a curveball, no matter what that boss says about me, no matter what that person lied about me, it doesn't matter. My feet are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. I'm good. I know where I stand. And so when Jesus looked at some of his disciples and he called them, now we're going to do it with the context of these shoes. Take a look with me in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. Now pause right there. We can just stop the message here. How many of you have a brother? Okay, five people, great. This is the interactive part, portion of our program. If you ever had a brother, how many of you ever argued with your brother? How many of you ever fought with your brother? How many of you still harbor ill will toward your brother because he broke your Sony headman headphones long ago and hasn't apologized for it yet? Really, I'm not bitter. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that Jesus looked at two brothers who have conflict? And guess what he says to them? He says this. They were casting a net in the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. Do you realize what Jesus did? He said, I no longer want you to live this kind of life. I'm going to give you new shoes. I want you to put on the armor, I want you to change your shoes. And when you change your shoes, it's going to change the way you two talk. It's going to change the way that you interact. Instead of animosity and sibling rivalry, instead of bitter grudges, you're going to realize that you're here for a purpose. And you're going to realize, even if you get on each other's nerves because your brother's in your family, you're going to realize, you know what, at the end of the day, I'm good. I got Jesus. You know what, I got Jesus. I, you're, you're bothering me. You know what? We'll agree to disagree. My feet are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Paul said this to the church in Rome. He said this, and how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful you people are when you understand where you stand. How beautiful you are when you realize what's most important and you understand every day, God, thank you for the breath you've given me. Thank you at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what is thrown my way because I'm good. I am standing firm. I don't have to argue. I don't have to kick. I don't have to scratch. I'm good. So here's a question. What shoes are you wearing today? What shoes are you wearing today? When you look at those shoes, what do they represent to you? Because Paul says, just a reminder, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. If you are sitting here and you're not peaceful, then you're not ready. Because there is no peace within sin. When you're making decisions that you know are not what God would want you to do, then what are we doing? We're following what the enemy would love us to do and there is no peace with the enemy. And at the end of the day, Jesus died on a cross so that he could bring peace to our relationship with God where sin would no longer matter because we can ask for forgiveness and there is no peace with sin. So if you are in conflict, if you are in chaos, if you're sitting there, then your feet are not fitted with the readiness. And so why are you afraid to change your shoes? And why do we refuse to wear the shoes that Jesus called us to? If you're a parent in this room, why do we refuse to teach our kids about the type of shoes that they should wear? And if you say, Terry, no, that's not a problem. I love to teach my kids about what it means and they have to go to church and they have to follow Jesus. 
But then let me ask you a question. Why are we showing off the wrong shoes then? If we tell them one thing and live another way, we're showing off the wrong shoes. So today, there were a new pair of shoes that just dropped from heaven. And here's the good news. They're not $2 million. They're free. And they're priceless. And today, you have the opportunity to grab them because there's enough inventory for everybody in this room and online. You just have to put them on. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth of this message and God, I pray for followers of Jesus in this room and I I pray, God, for those that are in conflict and those that are in chaos. And God, I pray that we'd be reminded today to put on the shoes fitted with the readiness for the gospel of peace. God, remind us today that at the end of the day, nothing's more important than our relationship with you and nothing's more important than our family's relationship with you. Nothing's more important than our spouse's relationship with you. And so, God, everything else pales in comparison. So, God, help me to put those shoes on. For those of you in this room that maybe are not a Christian or you're watching online and you're not a Christian, today is the day where these shoes have dropped and you have the opportunity right now. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to take off any other shoes. What you need to do is just grab these shoes. And the way that you do it is simply in your heart, professing this. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm tired of the chaos. Thank you that when you died on that cross, you brought peace. So I receive that gift. I take those shoes. Thank you that when I put these on today, I will never have to worry about my eternal destination because I will be at peace at home in heaven with you. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you for giving me this armor and I'm ready to live the good life with the good news that you've given. So God, we bless you. We love you today and we give it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless you.